was said by them of old, avoid all sin, but avoid most especially the seven deadly sins. Pride. Beware of pride, for pride puffeth up the great and causeth the mighty to fall. Beware of envy, envy. for envy robbeth of joy and leadeth to the path of bitterness. But above all things, beware of sloth, sloth. for it is adorable. Wrath. Avoid wrath, the spark that leadeth to deadly fire. Gluttony. And gluttony, the drunkenness of excess. Sloth. And also sloth, the cutest of all the creatures, which feeds upon twigs, leaves, and the hearts of men. Greed. Greed doth beguile the mighty of spirit, but who cares because sloth? It sucks thy soul to the abyss of cuteness. Lust. L l lust, lust. It doth tempt the hearts of, okay, seriously. It's so precious. I mean, look out. Uh, uh, uh. Beware the seven deadly sins, especially sloth. The most adorable sin. When we started the series on Undo and we were working our way through it and trying to lay out the weeks, we knew we had a couple of problems. We thought that it was worth our time to start the new year and just remind ourselves that our hearts can attach themselves to things that are not good for us. And so there's some... Historically and traditionally, though, some of those things have been called the, the seven deadly sins. But we knew we had two problems in the series, just being totally honest with you. The, the, the first one was, there's a sin that everybody does so much that we don't think it's a sin anymore. And then there's sloth, which nobody thinks they do. Everybody thinks they're absolutely gu not guilty of it. So the sin that we do and we don't recognize as a sin anymore is gluttony. And we'll talk about that next week. But sloth, I want to talk to you about sloth because why is it named among the seven deadly sins? It's also called cardinal sin, the capital vices. Why would it be named if it's something that's so adorable or so innocent. And that's because it's not. And we have misunderstood what sloth is. We have misdefined it. Like, in fact, right now, if you're like me, what you would be sitting there saying is, is oh, I'm, I, I got it on this one. I'm busy. I'm not still. I'm active. I'm moving. I'm busy. And that would be a misunderstanding of what sloth is. Sloth can be, but cannot be limited to what we would typically call laziness. It, it's deeper, it's more dangerous than that. A guy named Kreeft, who wrote a book on the seven deadly sins, said that sloth robs us of our appetite for God. And by doing that, it robs our zest and our zeal and our pursuit of him. Oz Guinness, who also wrote a book on the seven deadly sins, says that, it, that sloth is unique because it's mostly a sin of omission, not commission. In other words, it's a, it's a sin that we don't commit because we don't do things, it's sin, rather than sin that we commit. Sloth can be known as a carelessness, an unwillingness to act, half-hearted effort, easily discouraged by the difficulties that come our way. But the most helpful definition for me is sloth is being inattentive to the things that matter most. Now, you can decide what's most important to you, but there's, a, there's something that happens in our lives that we actually, the things that we say we care the most about, given some circumstances, we can actually stop caring about the things we say we care about. And so I would ask you, just right now, in the, in the state you're in now, not go back to your finest hours, 
but just what, the way that you are right now, how much do you care really about the things you say you care about? I was uh, coming out of Christmas. Christmas is a busy season for us here. It's a wonderful time of year, one of my favorite times of year. And I came out of it and had, had a week break. And in that break, I find, found myself as I was evaluating, I knew that I was being, I was a contrarian to everybody. I was being a little bit off um, with people, off-putting and stuff. And I started, I started paying attention to what was going on. And I realized family, which is very important to me, most of the time, suddenly there was some effort that I needed to make to be part of family. And I didn't want to. There was a... I won't call it an argument between Dana and I, but there, were ten, there was tension between Dana and I around this time. And I remember thinking to myself, honestly, and I'm, I'm not proud of this, but honestly, let her be mad. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go and try to work this out. But Dana's the most important person to me in this world. And I found myself in this state of mind where I had become slothful. I didn't have a word for it before. I didn't care very much about the things that were most important to me. Now, what this does is it kind of plays into, into some things like Newton's first law of motion, which is inertia, which says that an object at rest will stay at rest unless another object force gets it going and it tends to stay at rest. And what happened was, is I just kind of started thinking this way in a, kind of selfishly and I just kind of stayed in it. And before long, I was like, I don't, whatever. Now, thankfully, I have a job that won't allow me to live in the state of whatever for very long. But that's how you find yourself in sloth. You begin with some pattern. It might even be legitimate the way you feel about stuff. But you stay in that mindset. You sit in that inertia long enough. And one day turns to two. And two days turns to seven. And week turns to a month. I can't tell you how many conversations I have had with folks that love Jesus dearly and are a part of our community that come up and say, I can't believe, I said, I'll say to them, wow, I haven't seen you in a while, how you doing? And they said, yeah, I can't believe it. It's been four months. We just kind of got to going, got, got to going on some stuff and got busy on some other things. And now it's been months since we've been here. And the things that are most important to you Go without your attention. And again, I'm not arguing about what, whatever you say your priorities are, whatever they are, they can come under this kind of attack. And it will not simply make us lazy. It will actually make us unloving. Because love is always a step of effort. It's an effort to be able to love folks. And so here's what I'd like to do with you. I'd like to look at a command in the scriptures, a passage that clearly shows us that this has got to be something that we're aware of and that we fight. And then I want to go to a passage of scripture that kind of lays out for us how the Christian life will be lived. Kind of just lays out for us so that we can have proper expectations because I think a lot of the problem is we fall into sloth is because we think things are supposed to work differently than they do. And when they don't, it becomes hard on us and we turn towards inattention. Again, it's not laziness simply. It's inattention to the things that matter. So let me pray for us. We'll look at the command in Romans 12 and then the passage in Philippians. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather. And now as we pause, would you open our minds and hearts to you? Holy Spirit, come and teach that we might be aware of the state of our soul and that we might be instructed by your word and be saved from the damage that sloth can bring. 
Please, in Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12, in about the middle of that chapter, it goes into a series of imperative commands. And in about four verses, you get 11 commands, all just bam, bam, just shotgun start, just right after another, one after another. And it starts with this. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. And then it says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be in a place where you are lacking zeal, but make sure that you keep your spiritual fervor. I love this idea of spiritual fervor because it's, a, it's one of my favorite words in the New Testament t- coupled with the, spirit, the, the word for spirit, which is pneuma. So it's pneuma zeo. Say it with me. Zeo. One more time. Zeo. It's hard to say and not smile. I mean, it, and it's this wonderful world, it, it word. And it's also, it feels like you ought to sing it. Zeo. <laughs> right? And so you've got this beautiful word. And it means, it's used for like when water boils up. When the, when the waters are agitated and churning. That, that you should keep your spiritual fervor, your spiritual zeal. I remember when I was, had the opportunity to go to Russia to do some training for some pastors there, and I was, I was introduced to a large group of pastors, but it was very stoic. In the churches, these people were very gracious and, and very lively outside, but when they walked into the church, it was very formal and quiet and stoic. When I asked someone about it, they said that the primary uh, translation of the scriptures into Russian that had been used for centuries, actually, had one particular verse that in English we translate, there should not be among you coarse jesting or filthy language. And in Russian, it was translated, unfortunately, I believe, there should not be among you laughter or coarse jesting. And so for generations, they had been raised that the church was a place that you sat very stoically and never smiled or laughed. And Romans 12 would be in the exact opposite of that. It would be that we should keep this spiritual fervor. And the longer you are in Christ, the more that you are in danger of becoming a religious stoic where you just kind of, honestly, you just begin to look not very happy most of the time. And Romans 12 would say, if that's the condition of your faith, you have lost your zeal. You've lost the bubbling up of the joy that Jesus produces. And I think that, in my experience, we lose that zeal because we misunderstand the Christian life. You see, we're told that salvation is by grace alone, not a result of works, and it is. And we're told that it's by faith and it's freely given to all who will receive, and it is. And we think that because it's by faith and it's by God's grace and this ease of entering into the kingdom that Jesus has made it so accessible to us that it's the easy button for life. And that's a misunderstanding of how the Christian life is lived. And one of the best places to kind of lay it out for you is in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul, in the middle of this wonderful book, Philippians is the most personal book Paul writes. 
It's to a first century group of people in Philippi who are under serious persecution. And the theme in Philippians over and over again is joy. And he's writing it in prison. And over and over again, he says, you ought to to have this zeal. Even when things are hard. And he lays out for us some characteristics of how the Christian life is lived that are still accurate for us today. Five things. Let's go through them and maybe that'll guard us against this sloth. Because here's, here's something. To understand something, truly understand it, I believe you need to understand also its opposite. So what is a life in Christ lived? That would be the opposite of this lacking spiritual fervor, of lacking and losing our spiritual zeal. The first thing that Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all of this, and he's talking about the maturity in Jesus and all that Jesus has done for us. I've not obtained all of this at all or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He says, this this life is a process. Embrace it. It's not instantaneous. It's It's not a Jesus pill that you take and suddenly everything changes. We wish that it were that way. And sometimes we expect it to be that way. You see, there are some things about the Christian faith that are instantaneous. Happen the minute you believe. One is like justification. You are immediately declared righteous before the throne of God and given the righteousness of Christ because of his work on the cross for us. You are justified and declared not guilty and because of that, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But the process of living it out is not instantaneous. It's called sanctification. And sanctification is a process. And Jesus promises from the day you get saved to the day you go home, he'll be with you through that process. But if Paul says, I've written New Testament books in the Bible and I'm not there yet, then perhaps no one will get there immediately. It's a process. Embrace it. For me... The process is is best seen because of a discipline that I have in journaling. I journal um, regularly, almost daily, and it's a part of the, the discipline that I think will help you battle sloth. It's a time where you step away from the pace of your life. I actually take a pen and paper, there's something novel, and write. Don't type, don't speak it into existence. I write it out and I say things like, Y, which stands for yesterday, the letter Y. I'll write it in the margin of my journal and then I'll just write out the things that I was involved with. And I'll ask the God, search, to search my heart. Is there something I need to talk with you about? Is there something I need to confess? Is there something that I mishandled? And I'll slow, purposely slow myself down. It is not productive. Well, it's super productive, but it's not quick. And then next, underneath the Y, I'll just write a little T. The T stands for today. And I'll just run through my schedule, writing it out, praying for the meetings that I'm going to have, praying that I'll listen because I don't like to. I like to talk. Pray that I'll be quiet. Pray that I'll have understanding. Pray that I'll have wisdom because God says he'll give wisdom if we ask for it. So I involve myself in this process so that I can be reminded that there's still a lot of Jesus that still needs to be formed in me. I cannot live one day without his help. It's a process. Embrace it. It's not instantaneous. And I would say this too. It might be that That's why Christianity kind of gets tweaked in our heads 
Because we went in thinking that Jesus was some kind of a, you know, glorified, a skinny Santa. That's what Jesus is. He's a skinny Santa. He's there to give us all that we want. We just ask and he just gives it to us. That's what we thought. Or maybe like he's a genie. And we just kind of go into our Bible and we just say, Jesus, please, please, Jesus, please. And you know what? Sometimes you don't get what you ask for. Which years from now, you'll be really thankful that you didn't. Sometimes you just don't get it over and over and it starts to feel a little bit difficult. And you thought this Christianity thing was supposed to fix you. And you can lose heart. And then you can become slothful. And if I ask you, is Jesus important? You're, oh, number one in my life. When's the last time you talked to him? It's the last time you gathered and worshiped. It was the last time you read his word. It'd be, you have become slothful. It's a process. Embrace it. Secondly, he says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. You are forgiven, accepted. You are forgiven. Part of the reason the Christian life for some of you is so difficult is because you continue dragging behind you as this act of martyrdom, just all of the sin and all of the things that you've done wrong and you just drag them before the throne of God against the God, I just wanna tell you one more time, I'm so sorry for what I did last year. I know I've said it before, but I just wanna tell you one more time. And you just keep dragging all that junk around. Do you know that it says four times in the Bible that God chooses to remember your sin no more? <laughs> He's not stuttering. He's saying it over and over again so that you can get it. Father, I'm sorry for this. Thank you for the forgiveness since Christ. Help me not to do it anymore. Bam! He's removed it as far as the east is to the west. That's a long way. He's chunked it as far away from him as in the deepest crevice of the sea. And he chooses it chooses to remember it no more. You're forgiven. And carrying around all that stuff is burdensome. It's impossible to experience joy on a regular basis when you're carrying all that junk. Turn it loose. It ain't helping you and it ain't helping us. We're not impressed. You're forgiven. Accept it. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I love this, straining towards what is ahead. Life is a struggle. Expect it. Expect it to be a struggle. The word for straining for what is ahead is this, like maximum effort to touch something, pushing as far as you can to where you almost lose balance. The best picture from, in my mind is, is a sprinter running the 100 meters in a, in a track race, and right as they get closer to the, the finish line, they throw everything they can to try to get the, a part of their body across in front of other bodies. It's this, and, and they'll throw themselves so hard towards this that they'll sometimes stumble and fall right after it. They throw everything they have. Life is a struggle. It's going to be hard tomorrow. It's going to be difficult. Your phone's gonna go off at the wrong time. <laughs> Beep happens. You see, it, we could somehow fall into this where life gets a little bit hard and we're like, well, where's God in all this? Right beside you where he promised he would be. You must not understand Christianity as the easy button. G.K. Chesterton said it this way, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. 
See, people unknowingly, they, 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 when I talk with them and they'll say, oh, I, I used to be a Christian. I tried that. It just didn't work for me. Right away, I just, right away, what do I think? I think they had the expectation that the Christian life was supposed to be easy. And because it was not, it didn't work for them. Don't be duped. The Bible is super clear. Life is two things, really short and really hard. And God will walk with you every step of the way and we'll take, here's the deal, you're gonna experience that junk anyway. Why not have a God with you to walk through it and give purpose and meaning to the bad stuff you experience? It's a struggle. Expect it. Verse 14, Paul goes on to say, I press on toward the goal. He's used this word press a few times already. It's this, this athletic term of effort towards something. There's a goal. Go for it. Why not just determine in your own mind that this is important to me and I will place reminders in my life so that I will not embrace all the lies of all the commercials and all of the stuff that I hear that tells me I deserve some kind of a break today. And instead, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep pressing on. I'm gonna go for this goal. It's gonna come a time when Jesus is gonna look down and say, well done. And by his grace, just ordinary people living out obedient lives changes the world. Changes the world one life at a time. Press on towards the goal. There's a goal. Determine that it's important and don't be sucked away by sloth that is going to rob you of the joy. Number five, he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There's a prize. It's worth it. There's a prize. You can rest assured that there will come a day when God the Father will say enough. I've watched enough suffering and pain and sin. It's done. And Jesus will come and set all things right. Though he tarry, don't you doubt it. He will come, set all things right. And we will see the loved ones that have passed before us and we will join in this great host. And we will gladly lay down all of the things that this life has earned. And we will then begin to experience life that is truly life. There's a prize. Don't lose heart. It's worth it. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus said this, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks find, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Let's ask. Don't, wouldn't you like to have a little more of zeal? Some of you, you can't even remember the last time you felt Zao. Some of you, you're aware of the slippage. Jesus says, this is something he wants his children to be marked by. Let's ask for this, that we might reflect the joy that Jesus brings, that we're God's kids 
with really nothing at stake and nothing to lose. Because Christ has made us secure in his love. Let's pray together. And I wanna give you an opportunity. If you say, man, I would like more zeal in my life. Just go ahead and ask it of the Father. Just ask him to show you maybe what area of your life has allowed um, this zeal to be sucked away from you. What areas of sloth might you be somehow given into? Where are you inattentive to things that really matter? Oh, Father, it seems to me that if one-tenth of what we say about you is true, we should be ten times as excited as we are. We have been unaware and inattentive. And so we ask you that you would Instruct us where we have misunderstood or misanticipated what the Christian life is like. May we be now instructed by your word. And may it be an opportunity for Zeo to flood back into our hearts. That we may be marked with the peace and the joy, the enthusiasm you ask of us. May it be so for our sake, certainly, but for our world's sake, may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.